I'm Mike Cohen, the Director of the Graduate Program in International Affairs. And it's a particular pleasure for me uh, this evening to welcome uh, Juan Clos, the Executive Director of UN Habitat and former Mayor of, of Barcelona and former Minister of Industry in Spain, former Ambassador to, to Turkey. Um, but more, more important, I would say, than all of those titles and experience is that uh, Executive Director Kloss has been one of the most important spokespersons around the question of urban development in the world over the last decade or more. Um, he was very important in organizing the, the coming together of the organizations that focused on local government. Um, and the, the headquarters of that organization is now, there's a United Towns organization based in, in Barcelona. Um, and it reflects an enor enormous political understanding and, and substantive understanding of the challenges facing cities. So it's really a wonderful uh, honor for the, for, for the new school to, to receive you here. Um, he was here once before, I think in 2003, as mayor uh, of Barcelona, uh, when we were talking about the Universal Forum of Cultures, and our students were let subsequently involved in Barcelona. Um, and this evening, he's going to talk about the very important uh, launching of the Global Report on Human Settlements, which focuses on, on cities and, and climate change. Um, we're also delighted uh, this evening to have two commentators uh, on, on this presentation. Uh, Robert Buckley, who's uh, both uh, a faculty member here as well as uh, managing director of the Rockefeller Foundation responsible for urban development and John Clinton, uh, who's a professor uh, and the director of our new program on the management, on sustainability management. So this is a new initiative uh, for the university and we're delighted that John can also participate in, in this event. Um, the, 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 uh, the framework will be that we will, our executive director Close will, will speak first and, and talk about the report and then uh, Bob and John will comment. I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of Cecilia Martinez, who is the new director of the, uh, the, off the UN Habitat's office here in New York, uh, from Mexico with long experience in, in Latin America and the world at large on urban programs. And we're delighted you're, you're back in New York and we're hopeful we can, we can do some things together. Um, and there are many people here in, in the audience this, this evening, students who've been working on these questions, and uh, so we're delighted you're here. And we're also, this is, this is the most important room of our university. This is where the, the Board of Trustees meets, and among this, these very powerful murals where we talk about social, social problems. And on my right is the, the struggle of the, the, the Orient, and then on the, uh, the left, the struggle of the, of the West, of different kinds of political issues. I was telling the director, executive director Kloss, that uh, during the McCarthy period, these walls were covered. All right, so the university was aware of uh, the sensitivities at, at that time. Mm. So please let me welcome you and Thank uh, you. offer you the. Thank you very much. Would you, would you have a yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Michael, uh, and thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak uh, here in uh, and in this very nice and special room, uh, a real progressive uh, room. Uh, I, I, I am going to present you this cities and climate change uh, study report which uh, forms part of what uh, we produce every two years, which is the Global Report in Urban Settlements. Uh, this is a biennial uh, report, which has two parts. One part, it's very important. It's the statistical base, base database that uh, we, most of academics uses, uh, because every two years we re renew uh, this part. And this is mainly used by academicians. Uh, and then uh, in front of the statistical database, 
we present every two years a different uh, study, a different proposal, and this year has been the uh, climate change, cities and climate change, and next uh, edition of the um, of the global report would be uh, is going to be about uh, public transport and urban mobility in in the world cities. Uh, I would like also to thank the presence of uh, Professor Banji, which is the uh, director of the global report. At, uh, and is the one who takes care of the contents of this uh, report. Uh, but as I see that uh, we are here in a small group and, and we have a lot of uh, students and some professors, uh, I, I had a presentation, a very formal presentation, UN style, <laughs> um, but I am not going to, to submit you to such a torture. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm going to do a, sm a shorter presentation, and then I would like to, to open a, a dialogue, not just with the table, which I'm very pleased, but also with the students. Because I think that uh, really in the issues of uh, urban management or urban issues in general, we need to shake up a little bit the field. Eh? We need to, to be a little bit provocative for a while in order to, to review what we are doing uh, in the world. Because urbanization, uh, it's, it's now facing you know, two or three big challenges. Uh, one of it uh, is, re uh, in fact, uh, the contribution of cities to climate change. You know that this issue of climate change is very complex. Uh, although it's quite evident that the, that the uh, uh, climate is changing and that the greenhouses, uh, greenhouse uh, gases uh, uh, inverted to the atmosphere are the causal, ca ca causal relationship uh, in this climate change. There are some people who try to deny uh, this effect, and those people, um, they are quite powerful, and then that means that here we have a political struggle which uh, hasn't ended uh, yet. The evidence is quite clear. The research can be more or less uh, precise, but uh, the <coughs> emission of greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, it's increasing the world temperature, it's modifying the climate, and the modification of the climate is provoking some kind of uh, natural disasters. And the main sufferers uh, of those natural resources are the poor population. Mm? And this closes the, the, the circle of this dramatic uh, situation. Uh, one of the more difficult uh, tasks that we are facing now in the UN system is that uh, you know that the UN has, been, has become, in the last years, the defender of this idea of climate change and the need uh, for action. Uh, <clears throat> and it's not by chance. I think that it's a good example of a, of, of a, a reality. And this reality is that we have uh, something that we share all together in the world, which is the Earth atmosphere, that the Earth atmosphere uh, should be uh, cared for, uh, and caring for the atmosphere, it's, it's uh, an issue of protecting a, a common good. Mm -hmm. uh, and the economists, uh, as some of you are, they talk a, a lot about the, 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 the common goods, and you know that the common goods are in some kind very tricky and, and some kind contradictory. Uh, common goods, like the common atmosphere, or public transport in a city, or whatever, or safety in a city, etc., has this uh, um, paradox of the common goods <coughs> by which, uh, <coughs> if we have it, every one of us, it's better off. But if we cheat, 
we are even better off. Okay? If we individually trust in the rest of the people on caring for the public good, and we, as a free riders, uh, cheat the system, we became uh, better off ourselves. Huh? And this is a very tricky, tricky uh, question, because everybody knows that we need to address the atmosphere issue, but uh, it's not clear who is going to be the, one, the first to do something uh, really important. Huh? <laughs> and, and then time is passing, and, and we don't know exactly where, uh, to where we are facing. One way that shows that the difficulty of dealing with the uh, care of the atmosphere is that, to begin with, we don't agree in a common measurement uh, system. This is one of the most practical uh, outcomes of the lack of uh, consensus or political will to address the atmosphere uh, issue. For example, in the United Nations, that means in the Nations United, we have been not able to agree on a way to measure the uh, contamination or the gas emission of cities. Huh? And this is why uh, you will see very different statistics about the uh, greenhouse emissions. Because uh, strictly, you know, there's no agreement on how to measure that. We know by other means of study, by surveys, and et cetera, some uh, realities and some part of the um, truth, but uh, we have uh, political difficulties on finding out a way to measure. This is why, for example, you will see in the report uh, that uh, we don't agree on, on uh, how much do the cities uh, generate in terms of uh, greenhouse emission, because there's no, again, uh, agreement on how to measure that. The range goes from 40% to 70% which is not about range eh, of dispute. Mm? It's a good uh, you know, disparity eh, between 40 and 75. Uh, 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 the, the, the reason for such a disparity is that if we m try to, uh, uh, to make an approach, uh, or an, a proxy, sorry, for uh, gis, uh, gas, uh, greenhouse gases produced in the city, um, some of the studies and, and the, you know, scientists, they are, agree that they are more or less about 40% <coughs> of the production of uh, uh, greenhouses. 40%, which is uh, taking into account that cities represent 2% of the whole territory, but represents probably between 60 and 65 of the GDP, it's a good, you know, intermediate point. But, uh, of course, uh, the, if we add not just the production of the greenhouse uh, at the city level, but the consumption of the city, which imports a lot of goods from other parts, then this climbs to 70%. If we, if we add the directly produced in the city plus the greenhouses emitted in the production of the goods and services that we consume in the city. And that, uh, of course, it's, it's very important because you can say, oh, I have a very clean city. I only produce 30% of uh, greenhouses because I have reduced. But at the same time, if you are a very rich city and you consume a lot of products, then you are, again, uh, affecting the total uh, greenhouses emissions. This is why it's so complex, there's no agreement, and, and this is why we uh, advocate and, and we publish this kind of results uh, of uh, studies where we show the complexities 
of, uh, of uh, all these uh, facts. Um, the second point that I wanted to, to, to place in front of you in order then later on to have a discussion is that the greenhouses emission in cities is mainly a problem of the developed world. There's a lot of talk about uh, sustainability in the developing world. There's a lot of uh, talk about controlling the emerging economies and how they need to take care of uh, their uh, gas emissions and etc 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 but the reality is the fact is that the cities which uh, you know bring towns and towns <coughs> of greenhouses uh, gases to the atmosphere those are the developed cities uh, there's there's no you know the contribution of the least developed countries, which are 48 by now, uh, to the greenhouses uh, emissions in the world, it's less than 1%. Then uh, we, we, we can you know, talk very much about how should Africa address the sustainability problem and how they should develop their green economy and that, how they should do blah, 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 and blah. But the real truth is that the emission of gases to, at to the atmosphere, it's a problem of the developed world. <coughs> uh, and this is very important. Of course, the developing world, it's in another situation. They want to become richer. Probably they have a right to do so. Mm? <coughs> and if they have the right to, to become a little bit better off, Perhaps uh, we should try to refrain our, uh, you know, our uh, insistence on on them to take, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, sustainable <coughs> policies uh, once they don't have uh, still uh, development. This is a uh, this is a, a kind of moral uh, stance which is very relevant and, and difficult to, to, to tackle with because uh, we need to address it. And probably the only way to address this uh, thing is by the way of changing our energy system, but not in the developing world, in the world. That means moving from the carbon-based uh, energy production to renewable uh, energy production, but that it's probably more uh, feasible because we have much more resources in the developed world than in the developing world. Uh, when I see that in our uh, economies, for example, the cost of a kilowatt uh, hour, it's about three, four, five cents dollar cents and, and uh, the cost of uh, eolic uh, wind energy is six seven or eight cents and solar energy it's 20 cents uh, it's very tough to say uh, 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 an economic uh, minister of economy of a very <coughs> poor country that they should choose the expensive one it's not very easy to convince them to make this kind of uh, changes. Huh? Uh, probably, uh, you know, they, 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 they are now facing a, a, a huge problem, and the problems that they are facing uh, are related with, for example, the huge pace of urbanization that is uh, taking place in, in Africa, in, in parts of Asia, and in parts of Latin America, uh, an urbanization which is very is massive, uh, which is taking f form uh, in an unplanned uh, way. 70% of the popula urban population which is uh, living in African cities lives in slums, 70%. And uh, most of the, those people, they don't have a decent uh, job. 
and that creates a huge and complex uh, difficulty to those uh, governments. And, and uh, we are trying to help them in order to recapture this sense of uh, uh, designing the future of the city. Uh, and, and on top of that, we are saying to them, well, you need to think on the city, you need to address this mess, and you should be s sustainable, okay? Um, which is to add a very big complexity to the very tough and pressing issues that they already have on the table. But uh, still, uh, there's, there are ways and, and, and they are, you know, uh, in, in some occasions even means to begin to address uh, this difficult problem. Uh, as you know, the process of urbanization is accelerating. We are over 50% of our population in the world is already urbanized. And in the next years, all the predictions say that that is going to increase to 60, 70 percent, and two billion more people will be urbanized in the next 20, 25 years. But in Africa, the urban population will double in 15 years. And I repeat, 60 to 70 percent of the population lives today in slums. Imagine what represents that they are going to double the urban population in, in 15 years. If 16, uh, sorry, 60 to 70 percent of the population live in the slums, and if the, most of them, the big majority, they are unemployed. Mm? And this is really the big issue that, uh, that it's there. Mm? We need to help them to find ways of creating jobs in the cities, and we need also to help them to create the city, which is something that uh, we are not helping them uh, today, because we have, uh, this is my personal opinion, we have lost the, the knowledge of how to build cities. Uh, we are used to live in cities which are alre already finished or done, and they were done 200, 300 years ago in the basic patterns. And we, in, in the developed world, we have forgot, uh, <coughs> forgotten how, how to build a city. Uh, and, and we are not uh, helping them, uh, the developing countries, to build a city. And you just need to see the cities that they are being built around, and you, you realize uh, that uh, how difficult is to, to name uh, such a, a construction uh, a, proper, a proper city. Uh, this is the huge uh, difficulty, the ch huge uh, challenge that now we are living in, in Africa, not, and not only in Africa. And in order to address that, we are in Habitat, we are trying to establish some uh, new set of uh, uh, ideas, mainly based in three uh, areas. One is urban planning, the other is urban legislation, uh, legal system for the cities and for the city, and uh, urban economy and, and job creation. If I begin for the last one, urban economy, uh, urban economy, it's, uh, it's a topic which uh, it's quite, you know, frequently treated by the economists, and I know that there are some here. But the economists, uh, the economic science, have not taken, you know, enough uh, attention to the city. In fact, urban economics is not an economist uh, specialization. If you look at, at the specialization of the economist, you have a health economist, even a sports economist, tourists economist, but you don't have urban economists. And it's quite, uh, quite uh, you know, compelling and, and interesting why uh, the city has not attracted much more interest uh, <coughs> 
from the economic uh, science? It's, uh, it's a good question for research. Huh? <laughs> Here is a, a PhD uh, available. Huh? Uh, you know, Adam Smith said a little bit about that. Uh, Marshall also, as always, uh, said a little bit about that. Recently, Krugman did uh, you know, a lot with this uh, scale economy and all that. But, um, uh, you know, there's no, there's no real much. Uh, given the count that 50% of the population live in cities, that 80% of the population will be living in cities, and it seems that we are addressed to the city, that would, I th in my point of view, would, re would require more attention. But uh, uh, just in order to give two ideas, huh? Uh, we differentiate the two kinds of uh, urban economy, uh, economies, uh, which um, there's a lot of cities which they don't take advantage of. And those uh, two sides of urban economy, one is the economies of urbanization, which is related with the fact that if you declare this piece of land, uh, urban land, what happens with the price of this land? Goes up. Just for the fact that somebody draw a line and says, from tomorrow, this piece of land is going to be urban. Immediately, something happened, it's a miracle, and this piece of land becomes uh, expensive. Hmm? And later on, when the city is, um, begins to build and the street is not just a, a, a line drawn in a map, but it's being built, uh, somebody invest, somebody I mean mainly the public but also the private sector, invest on the city, on the street. And in the street they put a water and sanitation system. And what happens with the piece of land which is nearby the street if somebody invests <coughs> in a water um, and sanitation system? Goes up again. And what happens if somebody puts a line of electricity in the street? The piece of land goes up again. What happens if somebody puts an, a, a bus in the city? The piece of land goes uh, up, uh, the price goes up again. There's a, there's a, uh, 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 every, uh, you know, every speculator knows very well the economies of urbanization. They don't need books, neither economists, to understand mm, how to build buildings uh, and, and charge a lot for the buildings, especially if they are placed uh, in a good uh, place. The second uh, source of economical value is a total different uh, source of economical value, and it has to do with economies of agglomeration. It has to do with economies of scale. It seems uh, that if we have some density and we have some diversity, the transaction costs in the economy diminishes and the productivity increases. <coughs> then the city, when properly densified and properly diversified, it becomes a source of increased productivity. Okay? And that's another source of economical value which is very important. What happens in most of the African cities and also in South America and uh, different parts of the world is that those societies, those governments, those city governments even, <coughs> they don't have the institutions and the capacity to capture some of these uh, added value, some of this generated value. And in not being able to capture this value, they don't have money to sustain the city. And then the city, you know, became something flat with no production. And the city, instead of being a, an asset, which it is when it's uh, well managed, it became a liability. It became a problem, even a political problem because the city is a place where all the bad things happen. You know? 
I, I am, I'm seeing now in Africa quite often <coughs> ministers and, and presidents which are very happy of what is happening in the rural economy because agriculture is, is increasing. It's, it's, it's in, in some countries even booming. Hmm? And then the agriculture, it's a source of good news to the prime minister or to the minister of finance. <coughs> but the city is a source of bad news because every day it's a problem in the city. It's the problem in the slum, it's a shortcut in electricity, it's a congestion. By the way, the congestion issue of the cities, uh, traffic transit congestion, it's another common feature of the unplanned city. And it's very interesting because, you know, I can understand that a rich city becomes congested. But it's not, don't you think that it's something awkward in the fact that a poor city gets congested? No, I can understand that a rich city becomes congested, but a poor city, why should a poor city be congested? But if you go to the big cities and even medium-sized cities in Africa, you will see most of them congested. And one good example of that is Nairobi, is the city where, where I am living uh, today. No? Uh, then, we, we have, then we have, uh, in, in all these symptoms, the lack of uh, capacity to uh, convert the city from a liability, which is now, to an asset. There's no, <coughs> it's not a question of uh, management capacity. It's not uh, for managers uh, to address this issue. It's, it's more about politics, eh? because uh, to, to change the destiny of a city, you require something else or something more than management. You need a vision, you need a, you know, a will, a political will, and then, of course, you need the, the technical uh, um, instruments. Then, uh, in looking for uh, the cities and climate change, we are uh, saying now, that, yes, we can, uh, or we would like to help in order to create a, bet a most productive city, a better productive, uh, productive city, a city which becomes an asset, and a city <coughs> which is environmentally uh, sustainable. Let's accept uh, the, term the terminology for, for a while. And, and that is related to density and diversity. The way that we know that a city can be sustainable by now is through diversity of uses of the land and density, <coughs> compactness, fighting against the sprawl, which is the origin of the, is the origin of, of um, transportation, the demand for transportation, and the first uh, instrument of, uh, of the, the first reason for greenhouses emissions. Uh, luckily enough, densification <coughs> and, and diversification are the same issues which produces an, uh, 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 an, uh, a performing economical city. Then we have found a way in which by promoting densification and uh, diversification, we can address two of the big issues of the developing city. One is less emissions of greenhouses and the other is more efficiency in economical terms. And we are just trying to open this window of opportunity, trying to convince people about those facts of uh, life. Uh, I will stop here because I said that I will not produce you a very uh, UN-style uh, talk,
but I really hope that we will have opportunity to, to share and, and debate and even contra uh, our, our arguments. Thank you very much. So um, Dr. Close has put me in the uncomfortable position of commenting on someone who I agree with everything he says. I, he's working off a, an excellent report, so kudos, professor and madame. And um, he speaks wonderfully uh, like a professor rather than a UN official, so he puts me in a difficult spot to say the least. Um, I, I'm going to try to do three things, nevertheless. What, one is um, to tell, uh, to use a metaphor to say why I think this report is so important. And then within that metaphor, to stretch it a little bit and, and say, where should we think about putting our money in, the, in terms of dealing with climate change in cities? And, and that's more or less to try to elicit some conversation. And then finally, a, as an urban economist, I have to defend the urban economists. Okay. <laughs> so let me get the last one out of the way first. And this one, if you have to defend yourself when people say there isn't any contribution, it, it, it has the quality of... So when did you stop beating your wife? You know, th th there's, there's not a good answer to that question. And, but th th the one answer I would offer is that um, in recent years, uh, there's a new growth economics. And it, this new growth economics suggests that, um, in fact, it, it's based on the work of Jane Jacobs. And it suggests that no longer are we bound by just capital and inputs, and, and that the decreasing returns to scale of the dismal profession and so forth will override everything, but in fact, recipes and the interaction of people and cities and the agglomeration economies and uh, the urbanization economies that the, Dr. Close spoke of are so important to growth and that in fact, in, in many respects, some of the high rates of growth that we're observing around the world are, are, are being accomplished by just that. And there's new thinking in, in, in economic growth theory that's based very largely on this urbanization uh, theme. It's just beginning, and so in some sense, I think Dr. Close has a, a lot more power to his comment that urban economists have not contributed to these questions very well. So that, one, that one's done, as far as I'm concerned. Let me turn to the other two stories. And the, the one story is uh, one that everyone knows, and, and it, but it's wrong. And, and it's the story of uh, the frog in the boiling water. And the story is that if you put a frog in water and you slowly increase the temperature, the frog will stay there and boil to death. Well, it's a myth, and in fact, the frog jumps out of the water, and, and uh, even a frog knows that you, you have to avoid things like that. Um, but there's something to be said that perhaps we don't, and, and so the whole sense of climate change is, are we like a frog in boiling water? And so th this is exactly why the frog jumping out is what a report like this by the UN, and such a cogent report on such an important issue is exactly the signal, jump out of the water. This is do something about what, you, what the state you're in, or, and, and it may well be too late, that this trouble is, is, is looming. And so you have to do something about it. And, and so I commend the UN and uh, Dr. Close and his team for putting this together. I think it's extraordinary, and I think the cities are, are one of the keys there. So let me go into why I think the cities are the keys, and, and one of the keys, and, and how it can be one of the keys. And I guess if you take the, the issue of the frog and you think of the frog as, as a city, and, and then you say, what should the, the, the city do, this frog do? Should it try to turn down the heat? Should it try to mitigate the, the heat? Or should it try to adapt to the heat? Should it try to swim faster or put on a, a heat resistant suit or, or adapt, if you will? And so in the first case, uh, in, in terms of um, mitigation, if you will, if, as Dr. Close said, you have a free rider problem with fossil fuels being priced and having such an incredible externality, cities can't change that price. If one city changes the price, people will vote with their feet and go somewhere else. That's not something cities can do a great deal about. And if cities try to inculcate better habits and better practices, and of course there's a lot to commend that, but you bump very severely into the free rider problem. And so cities doing that is something of, uh, this is a bridge too far. This is one that, uh, it's very nice and it's commendable and I, I love uh, the, the symptoms that I see of this and the actions that I see of this, 
but it's not going to work. It has to be, it's a national level issue. It's something that it's pretty clear that you have to put taxes on fossil fuels and carbon. And if you don't, cities aren't going to be able to do it. There, there's just not enough there. And then the second point that Dr. Close raised that I think is also an extraordinarily important one is that one of the best ways to build resilience is economic growth, particularly in poor countries. And so if you try to make those poor countries, and particularly those poor cities, which in some sense are the, the centers of growth, pay for it, the, the chances of putting people, those countries off their growth trajectory is profound, and it, it's extraordinary. And it's hard to think of a, a system that says, how do you structure taxes and benefits that says that they should pay for this? This is unambiguously something that the developing world is responsible for and should pay for. But now you get into the question of there's a, there's a lot of attention to doing just that, and with the recession and so forth, there's a lot of double counting in what the de uh, developing world is saying that they're going to contribute. But there's a lot of funds floating around now to be put into this, and how it's going to be put into addressing these issues is, is I think, one of the most extraordinary questions around, and it's a particularly, I, I think, an urban question. So that, that it says to me, in terms of stretching this metaphor a bit, one place that cities don't put their money is in mitigation. So if, if you turn to the other side and you say, put it in adaptation, uh, where I think they should, what are the concerns there? And I, I would try to mention two concerns. And one of them has to do where I think economics can help, is that making bad bets. You know, the, the sense of, um, uh, the issue that cities confront is, what is the expected cost to them of uh, the incident that's uncertain? Now, suppose you're a mayor in a city that uh, almost certainly is going to have a drought, a flood, whatever, something catastrophic, but it, it's going to be within the next 10 years, and your term is two years. Many mayors would say, I'm going to self-insure this. I'm going to take the bet. I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to pass it down the road and kick the can until the next mayor comes in, and that, in many ways, is a rational response. The other side is, do you tr undertake activities like uh, insulating your infrastructure at incredible costs when it, d it doesn't pay to do it. And it, this goes back to the metaphor of the frog buying a heat resistant suit where the heat is going up at such a rate that it doesn't matter. So in, in some sense, this is an insurance problem, except that it's an insurance problem with a risk distribution that you really can't price and there's lots of uncertainty around it. So how you deal with this, those adaptation questions in very tricky mathematical and, and sometimes counterintuitive ways is hardly straightforward, particularly when you're trying to bring a, a democratic base to come along on this. And then the second part of this is um, what I would call the fiddling why Rome burns syndrome. And uh, here you could have very well-intended community groups organizing and bringing together ideas about what should be done. And they may be very important issues. And they may be, for example, take care of the waterfront so it's not the, the slum community on the waterfront um, isn't inundated by the next storm, and in fact, the dam is, is much more fragile on the other side of the town. So how do you do the calculations, and how do you make voice, which is so essential to, to organize these investments, but make it a voice that is in fact rational and calculating things that will indeed protect cities and the people in them from uh, uh, the crisis that's in front of us. And I, I guess this last point, links up very closely to the first point about uh, the difficulty in mitigation and the fact that so many donors now have so much money that they want to put into this. And I've seen this before often with international institutions wanting to drop a bomb full of money. And, and unless you get local buy-in, you're not going to drop that bomb very effectively. But that buy-in also has to be c correctly structured in a way that you're eliciting a voice that's rational and calculating things that, what are the real risks and the threats to our society? So uh, those are ki kind of my thoughts on this. And uh, again, it's more to uh, get people's reactions. But in general, I congratulate Dr. Close and his colleagues on a really nice report and one that I think is very important and couldn't be more timely. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Dr. Close. It's a real privilege to uh, address the report and, and to respond to some of your comments. Um, I, uh, I find it a very wide-ranging report. Uh, it addresses an array of issues in a way that really looks at the linkages uh, among those issues in an important uh, sense, and it's uh, quite 
quite bold and unsparing at times of uh, some of the uh, parties that shouldn't be spared. Uh, I see the report through the lens of an educator who is working with uh, students and faculty who are uh, studying sustainability issues in the urban setting, and so my responses will come from that, uh, through that lens. Uh, I think one of the most important contributions is the framing of issues. As you suggested earlier, if we look at cities as producers versus as consumers, it has a very different impact on our perception of what the, uh, the problem is. Uh, I, I think as well that uh, the systems dimension of the report is very important if we conceive of cities as we frame the, the issue uh, of cities as ecosystems. It also helps us understand uh, some of the uh, opportunities that we may have to address these issues. Uh, you talked a bit about the, uh, the political uh, will issue, as the report does, and Bob certainly alluded to that in his remarks. I think that uh, looking at this from the standpoint of an educator uh, situated within a university, I'm very interested in what universities can do to play a part uh, in trying to develop competencies among students and trying to uh, take advantage of the resources that universities bring uh, that are perhaps unique or at least distinctive. And that in part involves being a convener uh, on the one hand of various parties. Uh, there's a very uh, strong emphasis in the report on partnerships and the difficulty of creating alliances that can be effective. I think that in our experience here in working with other institutions, working with the government agencies, and working with uh, NGOs and community-based organizations, we've found, and I've certainly found over the course of 20 years or so of doing this kind of work, that it's uh, indeed difficult, but the university is perhaps very well situated to, to play an important role in addressing some seemingly intractable conflicts and uh, bringing people to the table that might not uh, engage otherwise. Uh, we, we see that need even in cities uh, like New York that we think might be very receptive to some of the ideas that the report uh, uh, advises that we uh, follow with such issues, for example, of uh, uh, congestion pricing, traffic uh, congestion pricing, but uh, also with projects like the Million Trees effort to try to bring trees to communities that don't have them and a very significant rejection of that because of an insufficient attention to some of the com community concerns around uh, what the importance of, uh, of that uh, intervention would be. And uh, I live in Brooklyn, and right now we're going through a real crisis about bicycles. You wouldn't think that bicycles would be seen as so problematic, but, uh, but they are. And so what that suggests when people say bicycle lanes are dangerous to our health is that uh, there is a real need to address these political uh, constituencies that uh, perhaps don't see themselves important, in important ways as stakeholders in, in a common sense. So I think that uh, some of the, the work that we're doing uh, in universities can help us to develop the new professions. Uh, urban economists uh, do exist, and there are good ones, uh, but just as, for, for example, the social work profession emerged a century ago as a way to address a set of social issues, uh, I think that the, the university has a very important role to play in developing new competencies and in, in indeed in perhaps uh, new professions. I think um, one of the uh, concerns I had about the report, among all of the recommendations, there was only one that stood out to me, and that was the idea that we need to deliver more information. We do, but uh, as many commentators, including Andy Revkin in the New York Times, have observed recently, more information isn't doing us much more good. The need to communicate effectively about climate change couldn't be more urgent, and so projects like the, the one at Yale on uh, climate change communication, uh, the project at Columbia on uh, uh, environmental decision making I think also plays a role in helping us understand how vital it is to uh, articulate the message in a way that will be received appropriately by the various stakeholders who can then be brought to the table. So, so I think the report takes us a very long way towards beginning to understand uh, many of the issues uh, again in a systemic way and as a uh, member of a university community that has uh, a tradition of engagement with social issues as the murals uh, would suggest. Uh, I uh, think that I'd like to have some conversation this evening about uh, how many of us, I assume, are from uh, similar communities in the academic world, uh, how we can do more to generate the sort of response that this report so well deserves. Thank you. Well, perhaps we could open it up and if people have questions, uh, 
Maybe we can collect a few questions. But I feel that the production question is a growth question. And one of the challenges in the way urban economics is posed and economics as a whole poses the growth question is it doesn't actually address the dynamics of growth within cities. It doesn't understand the production dynamics within cities. One of the reasons Jane Jacobs was so interesting was she was laying out how work expands, how innovation occurs within cities, and then how we take that take it apart and try and understand how cities grow. So coming back to growth, it seems to me that the opportunity is really in understanding how these industries in cities, developing cities particularly, function. This seems to be more an institutional question than it is a question of economic support, which is a lot of the habitat debate to date has not quite grappled with the question of how would you reconsider regulation around, say, national industrial policy, should it be regional or local, should this be a set of institutional institutional questions that can be regulated, we raise the second issue as a legislation problem. And I'd like to kind of pose this back as a question to you, which is if you had to combine your, your two issues, you raise the first one as the planning domain, you raise the second one as the urban legislation domain, and then the third is an urban economy and job creation. It seems to me, from my vantage point, where I do a lot of work with industries, that this is where the crux is. You can kind of tap the production side growth question of actually how the growth dynamics work. Along with this question, I see a lot of things over this here, right? Transportation, industrial production, and so on. But that's not where I see the economic debate. But I do see if you look at it from a, a very local lens, the real opportunity mm -hmm. to have to take the conversation. I didn't know that uh, such a number of uh, urban economies existed. <laughs> <laughs> in this room, there are at least four or five. Right? <laughs> I'm very surprised, uh, you know, favorably surprised. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I understand very well your, your, your preoccupation in that sense because this is probably in the nucleus of uh, what is happening in the African city. Uh, when we look at the urbanization process of the world, uh, we, we talk a lot about you know, the growth of urbanization, etc. But the growth, the, the, the most uh, and the biggest urbanization process that we are seeing in the world is the Chinese urbanization. And uh, looking in terms of historical evolution, the Chinese uh, urbanization, to my consideration, is a classical urbanization because it's related <laughs> with industrialization. Uh, I, I consider that what, are, what we are seeing now in the urbanization of uh, China is more or less what we saw in Europe uh, 200 years ago and we saw in America also 150 years ago. Uh, and then, from that point of view, the urbanization process of Ch China is a traditional one. But where we have problems of urbanization, it's in Africa, where we have a huge process of urbanization without industrialization, which comes to, to, to the uh, point of your, of your comment. And this is, you know, this is a very open question mark. We don't know what is going to happen. Because in human history, we don't have such a huge process of urbanization without industrialization. And then one comes to the question, why people then go to the cities if there's no jobs in the city? And I think that uh, one partial explanation for this migration is that in Africa, as I said at the beginning of my speech, uh, although sometimes it's not very explicitly uh, detailed or explained, there's an agriculture change. There's a green revolution, although it's not recognized. And the uh, agrarian reform of Africa it's taking the shape of uh, privatization of land, hmm? following the, the, the fashionable 
uh, you know, uh, liberal approach or neoliberal approach to 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 the economy uh, functioning, and and privatization of land and better uh, <coughs> exploitation of land uh, just pushes people out of the fields. <coughs> then probably the part a, a good part of the urbanization of Europe. A good part of the urbanization of America and a good part of uh, urbanization in China was driven for the demand of jobs coming out of the city. But now we are seeing another urbanization process, which is the push of people out of the rural area. And then they arrive to the city and there's no city there. It's just the space. Uh, and they settle wherever they can uh, and they stay there, waiting for, for something else. And that comes to, to the issue. This is my, my uh, profound worry about the functioning of the developing city, which is not able to generate uh, a system of uh, favoring the, the, uh, the, the, the good um, spillovers of uh, the city, the economic growth of the city. And, uh, well, you are, you are uh, I agree with you that a problem, uh, apart that uh, it's up to the economists to describe this reality, the problem is not, uh, an, econom is not an economist one, it's an institution. Uh, what, what those society <coughs> they lack, it's the, the institutional capacity to organize proper markets, to generate basic, uh, something that we, we, we have forgiven because the, it, it was given to us uh, 200 years ago. And this is what is much difficult. If, if we look at the uh, development problem of uh, developing countries, it's not anymore a, a, a human capital problem. Because you find people which is very well formed, very well trained. Some of them probably are <coughs> students of this university. Uh, I mean, and, and, and they can <coughs> compete everywhere in the world. There are good and well trained people everywhere. But what is lacking is the institutional capacity, uh, ca capital. There's no uh, political uh, consensus, and there's no political arrangements between the, uh, with, 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 between the uh, powers of the society in order to establish a, a, a field uh, in order to play uh, a good game. Uh, then there's still tribalism, there's still a lot of other uh, you know, means of organizing the, the people, even organizing the people politically, which is, it doesn't, it doesn't favor the creation of institutions. Michael Cohen and I <coughs> reviewed the, the UN Habitat Sustainable <coughs> Organization <coughs> program in 2008-9. And I listened to your report and <coughs> talked about institutional change and thought said maybe the frog needs, some frog needs to jump out of the water go, hey, maybe the routine, it, it's really what we do every day. It's, there's no big project here, it's the massive project we're doing every day. Given this report, is the UN Habitat rethinking the way in which it's divided up into sectors that make no sense at all? And all the projects we've looked at were like Lake Victoria, you know, you know the examples. And it seems to me that I find that also replicated everywhere, those sectors which come out essentially out of the 1960s and 70s in the way things are categorized. Is there taking this and say, you know, you and Habitat reorganizes the way it, it, it runs? You're a big city. <laughs> uh, yes, we, we need to review uh, our work uh, and our strategy, uh, but not just because of this uh, specific topic of uh, cities and, and, and urban change. Uh, I'm sorry, and, and climate change. 
uh, we need to, to review our thinking, and, and I think it's habitat, but also, uh, I would say, all, all the people who, who study the evolution of the city. Eh? Because in that sense, we, we don't explain uh, with enough clarity <coughs> what is happening and where are the problems, and then at least if we do a good diagnosis, perhaps we can suggest some, some corrections or, or some treatment. Now, if 60 to 70 percent of the population lives in slums, and uh, uh, unemployment is considered to be over 50 percent of the <laughs> working age population, uh, this is a, a mess. This is a failure. Uh, and, and then we should recognize that habitat, but when I say habitat, I say the big family of people who is working on the cities, have failed in uh, providing new ideas for, for in order to explain this reality. Uh, what is going on? Uh, you know, uh, and, 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 and yes, uh, uh, answering to your question, we are reviewing because I don't know if you agree with me, but uh, I see in general a degradation of the concept of the city. Uh, the built space that we are producing at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, it lacks something. Uh, there's, uh, if you look at the new cities, um, it's something lacking there. Uh, uh, two big avenues, uh, <coughs> no sense of belonging, uh, no proximity, uh, you know, and on top of that, uh, huge energy consumption. Then uh, I think that, yes, we have a huge challenge <laughs> and, and, and we need to begin to, to study the city again and beginning from the beginning. Eh? I think that the, not just uh, Jane Jacobs, uh, I think that we should go even to Aristotle. <laughs> you know, uh, because um, so we, are, we are losing something on, on the existing city of today. Uh, and we need to recover very fast uh, this idea. And by the way, this is also a way to address the emission of greenhouses. A more dense, more diverse, more compact city. It's, a, it's, it's not just a better city, which is the most important thing, and a most productive city, uh, but also is a city which is more friendly with the environment. But, uh, you know, uh, the forces against this movement are very strong, because who defends who is now favoring living in, in dense cities? Uh, how many of us are we defending in terms of percentage? Uh, uh, where are the big powers uh, insisting? Uh? And you know, that, that's something that, that the good city, the city which has uh, sense, and has a spirit and, and has a culture, it's a, a very political a creation. It's, it's a, a creation of a vision, it's a creation of a sense of identity, it's a creation of you know, a lot of things, which, you know, a standard technology of producing houses and buildings, <coughs> very nice buildings, isolated ones, it, it, it's not the issue. Hmm? Are there particular places or neighborhoods or situations that you can identify and can expand on it that are doing anything? I think that Manhattan is a good place. And you know, Manhattan was designed, the streets of Manhattan were designed 200 years ago. This year we celebrate, in February, we celebrated the approval of the design of the cities of New York. And, uh, and if we take in account that a group of people in New York 200 years ago 
they were able to draw the lines of the streets of this place. Before the invention of the car, can you imagine? They draw the lines of New York thinking in chariots. Their, 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 their thinking of the streets and avenues were chariots, not, 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 not uh, cars. <coughs> And the rationale and the, and the force of the structure of New York has resisted the car, has resisted the electricity, which, by the way, was not invented, has adapted to history changing the density and the height. <coughs> if you look at New York in, in two dimensions, it's just the streets and avenues. But if you take the third um, uh, variable, which is height, Hate has been changing many times. In fact, uh, hate has been the adaptation variable to adapt to the new technologies. Uh, and there are technologies which were in use that they, they are disappearing, like the cable telephone, and we are now passing to the mobile telephone. And uh, still, this piece of land is the most productive piece of land in the world. And, and when you look, which kind of science or inspiration had those chaps which were able to design this, this piece of land? Huh? Uh, and and it's a, I think it's a very good question. I, I, I hope that you don't lose the opportunity to celebrate the 200th anniversary of the grid of New York, because uh, it, it, it has introduced, well, it, it was, of course, a, a part of the movement, which was not just New York, but a lot of American cities. But <coughs> it, it was also politically related to the independence of the United States, because it's not a, a, a British uh, uh, urbanization model. It's not, a, it's not an English uh, pattern of urbanization. Uh, it was, in fact, a rebellion, a rebellion against the English city. It was a totally different thing. Eh? Uh, because you know the, 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 <coughs> the mining the, the, the factor in the English city, it's, it's the adaptation to the nature. It's, it's, the, it's a, in a way the garden city or something previous to the garden city. It's the following the hills. And, eh? uh, and here, no, in, in, in the States, uh, the young uh, first colony and then the, the young union uh, moved to, to a very different pattern of uh, urbanization. By the way, the other British uh, territories, like India or uh, Kenya or South Africa or Australia, didn't follow this pattern of urbanization that the states did in Chicago, in, uh, in, in a lot of places. Uh, in San Francisco, uh, in, with different characteristics. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, mm, uh, of course, there are very nice cities in the world, and, and, but it's not just uh, only beauty. Eh? Uh, it's it's mu much more complex than, than its beauty and other things. Identity, character, uh, culture, and productivity, and, and adding everything. Uh, <coughs> And you know that there's people who hate some cities and love the other ones, and uh, every person uh, belongs to a different party in that, uh, fortunately, in that sense. And there's no equal city, every city is different, as a proof that the city is a political, local uh, artifact. Artifact. It's something which, it's uh, human creation full of, of human intervention. Uh, the most, uh, the, 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 definition, the, the definition that I like most of cities, what, a cit what is a city? Well, there's thousands of the um, definition. But I, it's one that I like very much. <coughs> Who says, city, it's a place where you find what you are not looking for. <laughs> because if you are in a place that you find what you are looking for, you know, <coughs> This is probably a village or, or you know, it's, it's, a, it's a mall. 
Huh? But, you know, the city should be something else. Huh? Should be a place which, uh, well, this ingenuity and creativity and innovation uh, of uh, Jacobs, uh, yes, of course, this is this magic uh, that w when uh, <coughs> expressed in economical terms is the economies of agglomeration, the economies of uh, increased productivity, and all that. But uh, when, I, when I'm criticizing the uh, urban economies, uh, I am... I am, I am uh, reclaiming you, the urban economist, that uh, some kind of uh, quantification of the economies of agglomeration. Because if we, all the humans, go and rush to the city, that must be a very important, mm -hmm. uh, that must be a very important factor. And if you mention economies of agglomeration besides 200 things more, at the end, we don't know how, how important is in, in relative terms. Eh? How much is the <coughs> economies of, uh, of are the economies of agglomeration really affecting the productivity of the economy? You know, and I think that this is a very huge uh, factor. It's not very small. It must be very huge, otherwise people would not go to the city. Because we all like to live near the bushes and touch the soil, because we come from the bushes. Huh? Uh, but if we are accepting to live one on top of the other, something really, something really important is going on here. Huh? And this is the, the emphasis that I, 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 re, I, I will ask the <laughs> urban economists to, to explain with a little bit more of passion. Sorry. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. I think we're going to hold the questions now. Um, Dr. Close has another, another engagement. And I'd like to, to thank him and thank the panelists for, for these presentations. I'd also like to say that the, the university <laughs> Um, this university has a lot, there are a lot of faculty and a lot of students who are passionate about the city. We've come, people have come to be in the city, to study in the city, we're interested in our relationship to the city. Uh, the Milano School of Urban Policy is focused on the city, we're combining that with international affairs, and so we think that we have a particularly distinctive view of some of these things. And now with the new sustainability program that John Clinton is directing, we, we think we're really adding, accumulating a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of power to, to, to work on these things. So we look forward very much to, to working with, with, with Habitat, with the UN. But also, I think some of the messages that you, you raised this evening are particularly important. Um, Bob and I used to say that in the international community, uh, seem to have entered the city through the house and the bathroom before. We focused on housing, we focused on residential infrastructure, but not this definition of the city where we find things we're not expecting or, that we, or where value is being created. And I think the real challenge is to change urban studies in a way that gets to these more profound questions about, about employment, about productivity, about the future of nations in, in a real important sense. So I'm delighted everyone came for the conversation, and we hope to see you again and to welcome you, you back here at the, at the New School. Thank Thanks you very, very much. much.